Yo, we've oh. Yo, with Julian on the brown note and a review of the latest Jason Statham movie, the very new uh, The Beekeeper, which is on streaming already, even though it's, it's done very well at the box office, I think. And I've gone on at length as to how I am a, in a PhD in the action movies of Liam Neeson and Jason Statham. And it's been slim pickings um, for different reasons. The last sort of six or seven years of Liam Neeson movies have been relentlessly bad after he went through a purple patch of some of his best action movies. Uh, for different reasons with Jason Statham, and that's that he got hoovered up into the Fast and the Furious franchise. So he just basically didn't deliver any films like this anymore. Uh, he became too big and basically wasn't releasing much that wasn't Fast and Furious or Hobbs and Shaw or that kind of film. So The Beekeeper's a real throwback to the kind of movies he was making around the time of The Transporter. And the director's an interesting choice. I am a huge fan of um, Antoine Fuqua, however you say it, it's Training Day film, and the writer... Um, Oh, and, and the writer, as well as uh, Antoine Fuqua, if you say it like that, um, has also had an analogous career, David Ayer. He started off writing an amazing run of um, really stunning films. I thought U571, the Matthew McConaughey submarine film, was excellent. Uh, he, he wrote all of these, Training Day, and the very first Fast and Furious film. And it's been a mixed bag as a director, but not... Like he's thrown some really interesting stuff. Harsh Times, if you've never seen it, is a bewildering Christian Bale film. Well worth watching. Street Kings is it's not a great film, but Keanu in the grimiest cop film, LA cop film you'll see, is great. End of Watch is magnificent. Sabotage is another really underappreciated film. Probably Arnold Schwarzenegger's most underappreciated film. And he does grimy crime really well. Sabot uh, Fury, I thought was um Actually, a really good war film, the Brad Pitt tank one. Uh, flaws, yes. And, of course, Suicide Squad. We'll never understand what his uh, Schneider Cut will be like, apparently. But, um, yeah, and Bright got trashed, the uh, Will Smith film. And the tax collector. Oh, wow. That was a wild ride. That's the one where... Um, I can't even remember what his name is. But, ironically, I'm going to call Mia Goth's husband starred in it and got a tattoo across his te chest for this film that got like 13% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's ironic that I called this guy Mia Goth's wife because I actually saw her referred to in the press as this guy's, sorry, Mia Goth's husband, as I saw her referred to in a news article a couple of weeks ago when she was accused of kicking someone in the head on set as this guy's wife. And I was like, do you have any idea who you're talking about? So he's come back with a beekeeper, and it's uh, it's it's so near. It 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 could so easily have been a masterpiece of its kind, but it isn't quite. But it's still very analogous to like the Transporter era, Jason Statham. It's a real throwback film. Um, I wish that writers would show a little bit more imagination than the guy that used to be a top CIA slash Navy SEAL slash nsa operative who is invincible who ends up living on his own in the wilderness and is dragged back in and so like, can't you just put some like deviations on the road there so jason statham's the ex invincible they're called the beekeepers and which is funny see some of this film is so teetering on the brink of unintentionally hilarious i wish they just pushed it over the edge because the whole beekeeper thing ends up being quite funny. Like there's this, like this, the scene where the guy goes to be or not to be. And you, like you feel like the filmmakers have got it perfect there. And they, and they just actually really have leaned into the ridiculousness of everything. They just don't do it enough. But he's living in a farm with... Um, I'm never going to get her name. I can't remember what her name is. It's, uh, I think, Felicia Rashad, who's a, an esteemed veteran actress. She's uh, She's got this very multi-million dollar property where she's supposed to be like a, a meek farmer. And 
he lives in a barn out back, a barn, like a, a, someone's bigger than someone's mansion barn, keeping bees. And that's what he does now. He's a beekeeper. And he used to be one of the beekeepers in the NSA, who were a group of people. For some reason, like in the most laborious analogy the film has, which is I actually kind of enjoyed, they called them beekeepers because they looked after the hive, the hive being society. So they sat above the governments of the day and did things that needed to be done. And the most laborious part is that there are certain bees that will kill the queen of the hive if she's not doing things right or producing offspring that aren't of the right caliber. These bees will go and seek her out and kill her for the sake of the hive. And that's the world of the film. Um, she's ripped off online. Uh, it sounds like something that would have happened 20 years ago, but it's still pretty decent where she runs foul of a, you must install this antiviral software on your computer because you've been hacked. Um, and she gets all her life savings and including a, a $2 million from a charity that she looks after just wiped out in seconds. And we see this call center of all these tech bros whooping and hollering as they've just emptied all her bank accounts and she kills herself. Which leads to the introduction of Emmy Raver Lampman, Lampman um, as Agent Verona Parker, who's her daughter and turns up as an FBI agent uh, and believes that Jason Statham's the one that's uh, done this. Jason Statham plays Adam Clay. I really cannot stand it when directors force people to use accents. Just let people talk in their normal voices. We had the one of the worst in like recent times. We had Rebel Moon, where um, the, whoever the guy playing Han Solo in Rebel Moon was has isn't a great actor, but he can be passable. And they made him have an Irish accent. He's in space. And obviously, it's a not an easy accent to do. And here, Jason Statham has an American accent which just doesn't exist for periods of the film. Let him talk. Jason Statham's voice is like a big selling point. You don't need to make him do this really pol um, apologetic version of American accent. So anyway, he sets off to break down these call centers. As far as targets go... These call centers ripping people off with antivirus software and emptying their bank accounts is a pretty good one. Um, I think that they won uh, most of the audience on the side. Um, and he does the usual thing, the payback motif of going up a, a criminal organization, as with Michael Fassbender in The Killer last year, which I complained about being such a rote story line and progression and setup, is the guy who's, who's uh, wronged who is invincible and then works his way up a criminal enterprise until he gets to the top. It's, it's one of the most overplayed. I don't know why they don't, don't mix it up a bit. Although they do here a little bit towards the end in a very interesting way. Um, so we get uh, Josh Hutchison as Derek Danforth. He owns all of these call centers around America and Jason Statham just like starts tearing them apart. He's the guy that played Peter in the Hunger Games, and I fear he's in a similar boat to Daniel Radcliffe and um, whoever played Frodo. My mind's gone. He's one of those actors that's quite small and will forever look like a little boy because he actually looks really, really young, but he's perfectly fine. He's the tech bro head, and he's got a very, very powerful mother. I won't spoil that element of it. Um, because that's a very important and and worthwhile twist that actually elevates the final third of the movie. And he's looked after by none other uh, than the immortal um, Jeremy Irons, uh, who's his mother's ex-husband, who basically is um, the ex-head of the CIA, who's now basically babysitting her son, who, keeping him out of trouble. Um, so it escalates along normal lines. Uh, it does get tedious. Um, and I wish uh, it's so close to like just letting itself go and being gonzo and crazy. There's a bit in it where Jason Statham's like st stapling this guy's head over and over, which is laugh out loud funny. And they, if they'd have just lent into that more instead of like, going through these re repetitious and obvious uh, action sequences... And another thing that directors do in these films is 
Two or three deaths is much more impactful than 30. If you've killed 30 men with face masks on, it's just like, it's just, it's reductive. It doesn't have any impact. And you don't believe anything you're seeing. So just do, just have a few people. Um, so the the it, it, it was getting drifty. I was kind of tuning out a little bit. They don't define any of the characters at all. And I'll tell you what, the um, female lead, uh, Emmy Raver Lampman, as the FBI agent, is actually quite bad. Um, she's got a par- partner, Bobby Nadiri, who is actually fairly decent because he's so nonplussed about everything that's happening that I actually warm to his character. But she's actually really quite bad. But she behaves as though her mum hasn't even died. I don't know why they even introduced that element to the plot because she acts for virtually the entire film as though nothing happened to her mum. So she grieves for about 15 seconds at the start and then she might as well be... She's just like laughing and joking. And they try and make out that she's like this um, alcoholic cop on the end of her tether and then just kind of forget about all of it. So uh, Air could have done a lot better in various elements, but um, overall I found it enjoyable and it got much, it got over the line for me because of the fact that the last third introduced a very potent element. And they waste some of these people so much. Jeremy Irons is, is, is nearly wasted. Mini Driver could have been a much bigger character. Why did they waste her? But Gemma Redgrave, the esteemed long-standing British actress as the mother of the villain, is fantastic. Um, the kind of character you could imagine in Succession. Or, you know, The Crown or something or something like that. Um, she is fantastic. And she's she's not wasted. She's actually used nearly enough. Um, but they do waste a few of the others. And the action sequences are pretty decent. Jason Statham's decent. He does his growly Jason Statham thing. And it's nice to see a throwback movie like this. Uh, I, I thought he'd given up on them. Um, and his, his releases haven't been terrible. The Wrath of Man one with um, Guy Ritchie which is the only analogous film to his previous before Fast and Furious life, was actually quite decent as well. Unlike Liam Neeson, who released his three or four terrible action as a year now. So I'm going to give it a pretty solid 7 out of 10 for The Beekeeper.